Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tenzin Daekyong, and I will be uh, moderating the current session, which is the student panel discussion. Uh, for this session, we have Ms. Antonila Mathur as our chairperson, and we have uh, Ms. Sohini Chakraborty, Ms. Varunika Gupta, uh, Mr. Pemba Tsering, Tejaswani, Tenzin Puti, uh, Yasha Malhotra, uh, Mr. Kelsang Tashi and Ms. Sakshi Srivastav. Uh, I would now like to request the chairperson and the student panelists to uh, kindly take their respective seats on the dais. Uh, before I hand over the session to our chairperson, may I briefly introduce you to her, her to you. Uh, Ms. Antonella Matu came to India from Italy in 1977 as a postdoctorate research scholar for uh, Hindi literature at JNU. Afterwards, she served at the Italian embassy for over four decades before retiring in 2016. She started following Tibetan Buddhism in 1983, studying in both the Geluk and Nyingma tradition. She follows the uh, Nalanda Master's course and both the Diploma and Master course at Tibet House. She and her husband both have been members and uh, friends of Tibet House for over 40 years. Uh, their children as well, uh, Mr. Atisha and Ms. Mudita, they are also associated with Tibet House and uh, they are practicing Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, and I believe that Adisha is also a very, uh, <laughs> All right. I'll, uh, with this, I will hand over the session to Miss Antonilla. Okay. So I guess you got two things from this very brief, um, uh, you know, by bi so-called biography. One is that I'm quite old, forty years of this and four decades of that, and look at who is behind me. So. Um, and the other one is that uh, Buddhism is somewhat a family business, so to say, you know. So, <laughs> so uh, here comes uh, our uh, inspiration, Geshe Dhaji And um, yes, um, so where is that girl who asked the, the question in the previous, uh, the young girl? Uh, you were there, okay. So... What I wanted to say is that uh, just very few words because this, uh, I, I have a temptation of saying these kids, I'm so sorry, these students, students because, yeah, college students, yeah, college students, yes, senior students. So, yeah, they don't have much time to speak, so I'd like to save some of my time for them. Um, but I just want to say that um, I'm sure you have heard so many possibilities of dealing um, with psychological issues and um, the usual suspect when we talk about psychology is always the mind, right? The mind is the culprit and um, how to deal with the mind. Now, of course, every tradition, every religion, every system of healing have got their own uh, take on the mind. Um, I would say many of these systems perhaps look at um, reducing suffering, huh? reducing psychological suffering. Um, and of course, there are also the traditions that look mostly at the body, at the physical suffering. Um, the Buddha did not, I mean, as, as I said, since the Buddhism is the family business, I only know about that. So now, the Buddha did not look at reducing suffering. The Buddha looked at the possibility of eliminating suffering, 100%. So... Um, then, of course, now it's too long to talk about that, but in the Four Noble Truths we have that. Um, through understanding the causes of suffering and then applying a path to eliminate it. Now, when we hear that, then of course, uh, our young person, you know, where we heard so many possibilities, one says, where do I start from? And I just thought of some really, really, very simple thing that 
um, is one of the methods of, uh, of the million methods, skillful uh, means of a Buddhist uh, uh, tradition, and of course of also Buddhist psychology, which is a sort of a simple steps. They call it the three wisdom tools, which begin with hearing and listening, right? So you listen and uh, with some amount of attention and then uh, listen to what others have to teach. Um, and then uh, you reflect. The second one is called the wisdom of reflection or um, contemplation, which means that you really think about it, reflect about it, let it sort of really decant in your mind, you know, become part of your mind to the extent that you don't need to go and look at your notes uh, when you have to take the next step. It is all there, you have understood what it is. And then the third step is that of meditation, the wisdom of meditation, which of course means, now I'm not going to enter into <laughs> the old thing, but which really means that at this point you try to merge your mind, so to say, I mean, it's a very general uh, statement, but with the meaning on which you have previously reflected, like you become one with that. So, and, um, and therefore it means that finally you get, in, you get in touch with the nature of reality or how things really are, which in Buddhist terms means the truth of interdependence, and um, the absence of inherent existence. Now, I'm going to say these big words for those of you who make some sense. <laughs> and we don't want to take more time from these uh, wonderful young people here who represent, I think, a minority of a growing number of young people who are going to take over from the kind likes of the us old people and uh, take us into a better future, we really hope so. So whosoever of you uh, is going to start first, I don't know, the organizers uh, know the list and how I have only the names here and um, I don't know the order of the speakers. So if you can have, is it in the order which is here? Which way? This way? Oh, okay. Ah, all right, all right. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. Okay, so we have first Sohini Chakrabarti. Um, you are the one who was saying you're not from Gargi College? Okay, so, so tell us where you're from and tell us so, everything uh, else. Yes, I Because have... here is written Gargi, but she said I'm not from Gargi. I mean, I definitely am from Gargi. I'm an alumnus of Gargi College, but also... Uh, fortunately, I've also now I'm in a position to say I'm pursuing master. So by virtue of that, I'm in the Department of Psychology, University of Delhi. So I just wanted to bring about that little update. So uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to be part of the panelist as as a student, as somebody who's still learning. So with uh, with all humility, I'd, I'd first like to assert that I am not in the position to take any strong theoretical position. This is a journey of learning for me. I know much less than any of you who are sitting here. So uh, with that, I'd like to begin. I'm in a state of absolute confusion here. There are so many concepts, so many ideas, so many constructs floating in and around me. So uh, yeah, so if in the next... Uh, three four minutes if you find my words to be very fragmented and disjointed so i like to apologize for it so i think um at this moment um there's so much to share so i got fixated over the discussion that we had um on self-love so a question which uh somebody from the audience mentioned and uh, the chairperson went on to elaborate with the other panelists. And then somebody from the audience talked about how it's okay being selfish. And then I started to ponder over the idea of self-love and is it really, uh, this is my own reflection please. So is it is self-love, can self-love be equated to being selfish? 
uh, I personally would disagree. I don't think self love means uh, being selfish. I think it would be enriching oneself. So self love for me can be self enrichment, which may not be equated or cannot be probably equated to pursuing selfish uh, or having selfish pursuits. I'll take a very simple example. So if I go to the metro, um, suppose I'm in I'm in need of a seat. I think I'm tired. I have this realization that probably I do need us. I, I I like to sit today. I'm really tired, and there are probably one or two more around me who uh, who are going to fight for the same seat that gets vacant in some time probably. And I decide no no no. Okay, this is it. I want a seat, so I'll have to be quick and probably get hold of that seat. So I find that I am a winner. I get the seat at the metro. Okay, now um, so so. It's it's not a new concept to all people who are traveling in metro that between two seats, uh, there is a space that separates the divider between the seats, right? And a lot of people try to squeeze into that space, right? It's I mean it's it's a it's a public transport. You are allowed to do it according to me. Yeah. So I'm sitting, and probably it may cause me some inconvenience. You know, if somebody sort of squeezes herself into that space which is between me and my metro seat partner it can cause me inconvenience i can think that's my personal idea again what is this i mean can't you see we are sitting here can't you let me sit comfortably okay that is one way of thinking of it but then i think if if really if it's a, it's 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 not a big deal for me if i just squeeze a little towards left and my partner squeezes a little towards right one minute left i've ruined it okay I'll quickly go on to just give feedback of what I have experienced. So for the for the longest time, I've been a big, big fan of the cognitive therapy. I went for RECBT uh, workshops and I really liked the kinds of things that they were talking about, how irrational thoughts can, uh, you know, bring out the kind of pain that you experience. But I personally, so after having gone through that process of therapy, for a limited period of time, I had insight of what was going wrong. But somehow I felt that the same kind of insight I was not able to integrate it with my experience of grief, with my experience of suffering. So as somebody who experienced a cognitive therapy, as somebody who still believes in it, I see probably I was not exposed to the whole range of what cognitive behavioral therapy is. But unlike me, how unfortunately in India, my peers have had worse experiences with uh, with uh, uh, having received counseling so this is the reality that most of us as students or as somebody who seeks therapy experiences they are not able to integrate it for for a long term with their experiences of grief or with their problems at that point of time there is intellectual understanding but it does not necessarily translate into your everyday experience for a longer time so that is a personal critique of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy that I would like to give. Please, again, this is, yeah. Another thing is I have, I, I'd really like to tell you, I have also taken, I mean, practiced meditation, mindfulness, and I have derived personally a lot of benefit from these modalities, okay? And I'm so glad that for the longest time, anything that was not Western had been historically invalidated and everything was declared as being in the, uh, trivialized those therapies were trivialized they were not taken seriously and at this point of time i'm so thankful a sensibility towards respecting recognizing and having a critical view towards other things that can be of help to people that kind of recognition is being given to other therapies so that is great but what as an audience and as a as a person who's concerned, as a person who'd like this field to grow, would like to comment on, is often that when we are talking about spirituality, it gets so abstract that at a theoretical level, the audience is not able to connect with it. And that, that is my experience. Again, with when you practice, unless you practice, when you practice, when you come to practice it, you get to re sort of reap its benefits. But often the talk of spirituality or the kinds of things that Indian psychology or Buddhist perspective not all the time but a lot of times it becomes too abstract to connect with it at a uh, so yes I think <laughs> I think I've thank you thank you
Yeah, so uh, uh, thank you, Suhini. I'm sorry, we, uh, each one of you will have to be interrupted by strange sounds because you don't have much time. So think of the person who comes next and practice compassion. So what about Varunika Gupta? She is from Gargi College. You are from Gargi College, yes. right? Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Varunika Gupta. I am from Gargi College. Uh, so I would like to give a small introduction. Uh, I'm Varunika Gupta, a student, a teacher, a mentor, a mentee, a daughter, a sister, but most of all, I'm a person. Uh, as a part of an RECBT workshop, we were told to write uh, our, like, why are we worthy? And uh, the first thing, it just said, I am worthy because. And for those who couldn't um, say why they are worthy, they, they were, had to write, why, how can they become worthy? So I would be worthy if. And uh, in a room full out of 12 people, it took me the least amount of time to write down why I'm worthy. Uh, it was surprising to me to see the huge list of people, uh, that the huge list that people had produced imposing themselves, imposing on themselves a whole prison of conditions. Conditions of why they are worthy or what would make them worthy. But at the same time, it wasn't that surprising at all. They didn't write something bad because um, what they said is what I and what I think all of us have been hearing ever since all our childhoods. Um, they said, I'm worthy because I'm honest. I'm worthy because I'm compassionate. I'm worthy if I help others. I'm worthy if I'm kind. I'm worthy if I'm punctual, soft-spoken, in control of my emotions, and so on. Um, but in our strive to, in our almost obsessive want to become any or all of these, we often forget in the process to be happy. What did I learn from the past three days? Um, to be honest, what did I not? As a mentor for the mental health group in our college, a lot of young adults seek me out to talk about the issues in their lives, some leaning more towards disorders than others. Uh, sometimes they seek me as a source to get professional help to provide them informational support but more often than not um, they come to me because they don't have they, they don't want to seek professional help while talking to them I realized that all that I had learned from my mentors and my teachers about listening and being non-judgmental having empathy a kind body language while it worked it wasn't enough I paraphrased, I summarized, but instead of uh, looking relieved or lighter or understood, my peers looked at me as if I didn't understand. Uh, over the time, I learned that along with using the skills that I learned in my counseling course, I need to use my knowledge of the self, of psychology, to share, to psychoeducate in a dil diluted form. Uh, for them to understand the things that most of us here understand. Because of the immeasurable nature of the concepts that I was trying to explain, it was quite difficult for me to find the right examples, to find the right words. It was said just now that we are all searching and that is quite true. Here today I found, I found the simple words to be able to explain about the mind, spirituality, psychiatry, thoughts, and even our own inner children. I am Varunika Gupta and I am worthy because I am. Thank you. Okay, I, I've been wondering all the time, when is she going to say the answer to that test? Yeah, very well done. Good speaker. So the next one is Pen Patseri from IGNOU. Oh, Namaste, Julie to everyone. Uh, my name is Pen uh, I studied my Bachelor in Psychology from Delhi University. And currently, I'm working in a uh, Tibetan rehab center, which is in Dharamshala, as a volunteer. And also, I'm doing a uh, rural development from IGNO. So, like, I will speak. I have a uh, 180 second. So, like, from this, from this eight, 180 second, I will speak on three diff different level. First, my uh, what I have learned from this uh, conference. And second is like, uh, what about my experience? And third is about like, top 
my view related to this topic. So like, um, I'm a little bit nervous, but I will try my best. So like, uh, my, what I've learned from this conference is like, uh, from the art-based therapies, I learned that it changed my perspective because like, from art-based therapy, ther art based therapy i think like to be uh, to conduct an art based therapy you should be good in art drawing but like when i conduct the pre conference then i change change my perspective and then now i want to do art based therapy in future according to my capability and second what i've learned from uh, from banyan banyan i learned that uh, they are talking about the homeless they are helping to the homeless women so this really really touched me so it becomes to being a refugee, to being a Tibetan, is, is a homeless word. I think many Tibetans, there are so many Tibetans, so they can understand what homeless means to me, means to them. So like, for me, being a homeless, it's really touched me, but if you change your perspective, today I think like, wherever I go, is my home. So like, if you change the perspective, it will also be very helpful for me. And third is like, mindfulness based on cognitive, cognitive therapy, like recently, I have conducted a mindfulness based on cognitive therapy, which is about relapse prevention in my DA teaching center. I teach an eight big program, so it's really, really relevant to me. So I got more knowledge about this. So these three points, which really hit, hit me in my heart. And also like for the rest, I didn't got understood properly. So sorry. <laughs> and, and my second point is my experience. So like many of you talk about the mental illness. So I am a mental illness survivor because like when I was in school, like I left my parents back to Tibet. Then I came to study in India. And then my, I left my parents when I was at the age of six. So then I went to school. Then like so many problems, as you know, now already new from a psychology background, mental illness background. So like for me, like I went into addiction life. Then I become survivor from addiction life. Right now I'm living supper like not living like kind of living supper marijuana for five years and from alcohol six months from smoking six months so like and i'm also working in a rehab center <laughs> so i have a limited limited time so like that's my experience like mental illness like i'm a mental illness survivor because i'm so today from that day i survived then i thought my, in my thought i came i want to become a day addiction psychologist so that's why i choose bachelor in psychology and right now I'm working so in future I'm going to clinical and then in future future I will become a addiction psychologist <laughs> and third third point is like understanding psychology in western and eastern perspective my root is from eastern eastern perspective and uh, my root is from eastern perspective eastern perspective because I'm a buddhist and I am also like from the childhood our teachers have taught that even if you find a small animal, you cannot kill that animal. You need to save even a small ant. So that's how compassion is in my heart from the childhood. So from Eastern perspective, then I like our knowledge is much more Eastern perspective because like we are studying in India. India was colonized by the British and the, India has copied the like study structure from Western. Then my like what to say, <laughs> thinking process is more about Western people. So like I'm a mix. So these topics will really touch me. And so the future, you need to both study East and Western. And if you study both Eastern and Western, it will be very, very helpful for you. Thank you. Thank you, Pempala. I think all of us love you a lot for <laughs> just the love that you transmit to us. And I just want to say that uh, it's very interesting how he is, you really uses the Tibetan Buddhist method that first he gave the summary of what he's going to say and he didn't lose that track all the way through. Now this is a very good sign according to me, isn't it, Geshe? Yeah. So the next person is Tejaswini and she's also from Gargi College. Um, a very good afternoon to everyone and I would like to say that I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you to Tibet House and thank you to Rizvi ma'am for being here for me. And um, so what I'm going to say most of it comes from personal experiences and learnings and some of it has some theoretical and scientific basis. So I would like to start by saying that psychoanalytically speaking, our adult personalities are a result of the developmental stages or experiences in general that we undergo as children. 
and um, our safety and our freedom lies in the hands of our primary caregivers or our parents so to say and they are themselves not perfect beings because nobody is perfect and um, their parenting has uh, very many different results upon us that may not be healthy for us um, which is the result of the lack of proper parenting on the part of their parents so this is something that is known as intergenerational trauma and trauma doesn't necessarily have to be something big like um, that is also considered trauma like if somebody was mentally harassed or physically abused that does count under trauma but even things such as neglect on the part of a parent or unavailability on the part of a parent or enmeshment on the part of a parent also results to um, uh, some uh, results in our personalities being dysfunctional when we grow up so and sometimes their judgment um, their judgments are overruled by their own issues so we need to be understanding of the fact that um, the, uh, we also hold sole responsibility for how we behave when we grow up um, so clearly visible in our culture we can see dysfunctional families in the form of a disengaged system or in an enmeshed system we see there is a lack of boundaries or an absence of boundaries or we see that there are high and mighty walls built in between various family members as if they are not a family um, it can also trauma can also be imbibed uh, in the form of say discrimination if there is a boy and a girl and our culture allows for such discrimination to openly take place that can also disable a person from feeling confident when they grow up and affect their esteem so now uh, this was psycho this was from the point of view of psychoanalysis now humanistically speaking our life is in our hands and we can become whoever we wish to be if we take responsibility for our actions and our thoughts now like ma'am said suniti ma'am in her uh, presentation she talked about the inner child so um, there is a grave um, in uh, need to be in touch with our inner uh, child in our child and uh, what we need to do is listen to that and tend to that child because that is a part of us as well and now that we are adults we can show up for that child now how can we do that so personally I do two things I meditate and I write a journal which I have displayed on the board outside it's called the future self journal so while writing that journal you keep in mind who you would like to become and it is a process of unbecoming of all the social narratives that have been put into your head all the conditionings that have been um, fed to you even if you did not want them because as kids we don't really we are we do not have the intellectual capacity to process things uh, from our own points of view so we just take things as they are given to us but now that we are old and understanding enough it is in our hands to become whoever we wish to be and the first step is self-awareness to know what our issues are where we come from the second step is that of acceptance accepting that this is what is wrong with me and this is what is right with me and building upon that and then the third thing is to actually take action and do what is right for us i would like to end by um speaking something that i just wrote and i would like to recite it if time allows um dear change you knock on my door at odd times when I am curled up in bed crying myself to sleep. You see, inherited familial wounds tend to itch at the end of the day in the middle of the night. Dear change, you trespass in class when I am barely managing to withhold, to withhold my wails as I stare at the screen. Lifespan development lessons endorse my firm belief in life's perpetual drudgery. There is a hurricane of voices within me, muffled voices of the oppressed, noises of world leaders, screams of dying humanity, cries of cut trees, shrieks of creatures crushed by cruelty, and graying water bodies. Among these voices, you reach out to me. You enable me to find my voice, to speak for myself, and those sidelined in a society that suffocates many. Dear Change, I am grateful to you for having come my way. You are the only constant, some say. You set me free, but first, you lock me in a cage. 
you enlarge me to nothing one second and reduce me to everything the other. You break me down, you build me up, I get back up, hoisting the self over and over again. You help me in helping myself. I embrace you like a best friend, a constant, I say. Thank you. <laughs> so, Jasmini, I think in future you will also be uh, participating in some conference on poetry. Um, and you'll do very well. Now, the next one is Tenzin Bhuti from Chandigarh University. Uh, a very warm greetings to all of you. Uh, I find it really hard to, you know, share my learning experience gathered uh, through the conference as well as my journey of studying psychology, even though it's just been like three years. Uh, because personally for me it's been really transformational studying this discipline and regarding this today's conference it's been an eye-opener for a student like me and I also believe for the fellow student as well and it's been very enlightening because in our universities and I believe in most of the educational institution the focus is more on the Western psychology and you know even though the Eastern school has survived through the ages and it is something that is rooted in philosophy and our text, but the focus is very less. And only in the recent year, we have been studying both the schools in holistic way. So for me, I believe that the real uh, learning or the joy of learning truly begins when you gain the holistic and the integrated understanding of both the school. Only then you start questioning and then you get the real understanding. So, the second major focus of the today's conference is on mental health, which I also believe is a very important topic and a subject of discussion in today's world. Because in the recent eras, we are more engaged in our own virtual world and we are not even bothered by the people uh, who are sitting next to you because you are more connected and you are more updated with the friends who are miles away to you. And I don't really know whether it directly cause depression or anxiety in people but it do contribute in causing so, uh, social isolation withdrawal and anxiety so as mentioned by one of the speaker the least thing we can do is to listen very empathetically to people who are actually suffering through mental illnesses and i also really experience this experience it because you know uh, for people who is going through mental suffering, venting out involves lots of guts and courage. And you know, uh, when they actually share something to the people who trust them, it is kind of like a great healing for them. So I think all of us can just do a small little thing by just listening to them because uh, I believe that we are all responsible for breaking down the stigma associated with mental health and creating awareness about it. So I think we can take a promise to help those who are dealing with mental suffering. And yeah, by then I would like to thank Geshila and Tibet House for always coming up with such an interesting and interactive conference. Because, you know, the, uh, attending such conference really inspire and, and empower us to study more because uh, personally, I am a Buddhist, but I have very limited information on Buddhist philosophy because we are taught more of the Western school. But today, when I listen to all the panelists and very profound speakers speaking on both the school, it really expanded my horizon and really taught me a lot. So thank you so much, and I owe uh, all of this to Geshla and to that house. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tenzila. And uh, we have now Yasha Malotra from Gargi College. Gargi College, Delhi University, as you all know. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to start by saying that as a student, I think this was a great opportunity for us to gain knowledge beyond our textbooks. 
I would like to thank Rizvi ma'am for this opportunity and the facilitators of this program for organizing this event. In the words of Sadhguru, and I quote, the way out is in. And as I understand, the answers and solutions to all our problems lie within us and not outside. This can also be correlated with the concept of the vital force, which is considered to be a self-healing energy present in every individual, as said by Dr. Tiwari. And uh, I think by that, I mean that all of us have the capacity to overcome any problem and any obstacle in our lives. And um, the perspective of positive psychology, which focuses on what makes life worth living, uh, was extremely thought-provoking since uh, I feel that we are so busy fixing things that are wrong in our lives, we completely forget to appreciate the good things. And in my mental health chart displayed outside, I have depicted what uh, self-care means to me. And there are a few practices that I follow on a daily basis, which I would like to share with all of you. Um, one of them is maintaining a gratitude journal and also meditating and uh, the specific form of meditation called Twin Heart Meditation in which we send love and healing to Mother Earth in order to inculcate qualities like compassion and selflessness. And I am also a Reiki practitioner and, um, and besides all of this, I am very fond of physical every form of physical exercise particularly CrossFit and um, recently I have started uh, doing yoga as well and I guess the combination of both um, a, a combination of yoga and CrossFit and uh, a healthy diet has really added to my res res resilience and is a primary coping mechanism in my life. This personal effort has validated my opinion that mind and body when in sync will not just ensure a longer life, but a happy one too. So I think knowingly or unknowingly, I have been practicing many of the Eastern Western perspectives and therapeutic modalities. And that's the reason why this conference has been very intriguing for me. And in future, I wish to gain more knowledge regarding the subject and hopefully someday use it to help people overcome challenges and lead a healthy and happy life. I also have an inclination towards art-based therapy a practice <clears throat> as a practice simply due to the metaphorical interpretations and how in turn they are used to understand healthy individual. I have a personal experience um, that I uh, dealt with uh, in this internship that I did um, while working with a teenager who suffered physical and mental trauma in the form of molestation. The psychologist used art-based therapy in which she um, uh, sort of told the child uh, or the teenager to uh, draw a picture of herself. What was pretty, uh, peculiar and what I noticed was that uh, in her drawing she drew a huge castle in which she lived alone and after conversing and interpreting we came to the conclusion that the drawing signified that she did not trust anybody around her and we had to work on helping her realize that she can <clears throat> rely on others and trust them to help her when in need. Uh, as per my understanding, all therapeutic modalities, whether Eastern or Western, work on building insight and self-awareness, which is aimed at inculcating the will to change and transform for the better. What really stayed with me uh, was the Buddhist psychological perspective explained by Naveta ji. Uh, relating to the concept of letting loose and overcoming our fears related to loss and pain. In my, what I also correlated it was the various forms of defense mechanisms that we use like denial, suppression of emotions, projection are all forms of covering up our fears and vulnerabilities. We as individuals start, need to start addressing our internal conflicts and seeing things the way they are and uh, also lastly my main takeaway from this incredible learning experience is that a holistic and eclectic approach in treating clients is the need of the hour uh, it is important to treat every case keeping in mind the individual differences a blend of eastern and western approaches seems the 
way to go about it and also what we refer to as the biopsychosocial and spiritual perspective thank you so much for this experience thank you thank you yasha uh you reminded me when you spoke of the twin hearts meditation i don't know how many people know about this this is part of the pranic healing tradition of master chaw kok suya i happen to be a certified pranic healer which i always forget about except when i find somebody sick then i can i do some pranic healing for you so now kelsan tashi from christ university bangalore <clears throat> hello. Hey, hello, Namaskara, Sister Ethel. Wanna come, Ni Hao. Anya, see you. Tashi Dele. I was from Christ University uh, and I'm Naruba Fellow right now. Mm. I need a small help before I start this. Uh, Nevitaji, will you help me to point your finger? at where I am right now. Will you? Thank you. Okay. Madam, ma'am, uh, will you help me to point your finger at where I am right now? Thank you. Now, now all of you are pointing here, right? Actually, I'm not here. I'm in your eyes. But I'm not in your eyes. I'm in your mind. And the seat for mine is in your brain, which means hospital law, right? So if I make some sort of mistakes in between, if I make some <clears throat> a bad comments in between, I'm not responsible. You're you are minus responsible. <laughs> so on 14th Feb, we had a workshop. And from yesterday till this time, we were enjoying a big cell, a big cell of knowledge, right? And I felt that I have started my education after I finished my degree. And I cannot tell you how fortunate I am to get this opportunity. And this will be one of my best weekend ever. Thank you so much for that. And we have been discussing about interconnectedness and interdependence, mindfulness. So it it reminded me of a beautiful formula, 20-20-20 formula, uh, which connects mind, body, and soul. So I would like to share that formula with you. Uh, so 20-20-20 formula. Uh, however busy or dark or difficult we are, we can spend at least one hour for ourselves, right? So if we divide that one hour into three parts, we will have 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. 20 minutes for body, 20 minutes for mind, 20 minutes for soul, right? So for, for the first 20 minutes, which we can spend on our body, we have to move. Exercise. Exercise can be anything, walk, jogging, running, stretching, whatever it is. It will cleanse our cortisol, rise dopamine, increase serotonin, which will help us to focus productivity, energy, and it will lessen our stress, right? And next 20 minutes for our soul, which is quite time, we can uh, use it for meditation, retrospection, introspection, thank you so much. Uh, for an, it will boost our gratitude, positivity, creativity, and all. And the next 20 minutes, we can use for our mind, which is to grow. We can spend 10, uh, 10 to 20 minutes for reading or listening to some sort of podcast or whatever. That is to deepen our knowledge and accelerate our confidence, right? Uh, that I can connect with, and most of them have shared so much about it. And finally, yesterday someone mentioned about Randy Discus, who uh, said that I think therefore I am. Actually, we are therefore we think, right? We are not thinking the life, we are actually living the life. 
It is therefore let us live the life we love and love the life we live. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Gatsanda. Um, yeah, actually, I believe, uh, I mean, I believe I, the, the Buddha said, um, we are what we think. So that is not exactly we think, we are because we think. No? That is, uh, I'm agreeing with you, I'm saying <laughs> that the Buddha was smarter than Descartes. That's my opinion. Sorry, uh, just an opinion. So now the next one and the last one. And before we come to the last, just just I want to say that I am personally very grateful to uh, the organizers and particularly for um, to Vigeshala because it has become a sort of a um, recurring feature of any conference uh, where uh, Tibet House is involved. Um, to allow the young generation to have the last word, which is really rare to find in this uh, patriarchal or uh, age uh, seniority kind of privileged society. So uh, these are the people who are taking us to the future. I don't know, someone must have picked many toppers among them. I am uh, really impressed with most of them. Let's see what the last words of the last one are like. Uh, this is Sakshi Srivastava, again from Gargi College. Good afternoon. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers for creating a space where people who share a common zeal and passion for psychology have come together and blessed us all with knowledge and new ideas. I'm relatively a newer addition to the family of psychology and until yesterday, I knew everything there is to know under the subject. I took every opportunity at family gatherings to boast about the limited knowledge I have and felt on the top of the world. But yesterday, my eyes have been forced open. I feel like I'm a student again in 11th standard and starting psychology all over again. I would thank the organizers for that, for opening my eyes. <laughs> To start with the theme of Eastern and Western perspectives, I was pretty excited because in our normal curriculums, we have been exposed to a limited subject matter. This conference has opened a lot of new channels for me, but also made me realize that my everyday actions, thoughts, feelings were already psychologized by the narrative of Eastern perspectives as implied by Dr. Kiran Kumar in his speech. Psychology being an empathetic and a compassionate space that doesn't create boundaries between the Eastern and Western perspectives, but rather integrates them for the benefit of all. To further add on that, both perspectives at different times were working on the same concepts, but with different names. For example, the theory of four senses of humor black bile, blue bile, blood, phelim by Hippocrates is almost on the similar lines of the Indian concept of doshas of vita, pitta and kabaha. To quote another example, Seligman's theory of happiness speaks of higher purpose and so does the philosophy of Buddhism. The Western perspective as it comes to me works basically on the observable and empirical evidence while the Eastern perspective speaks more about the inner self and emphasizes more on the preventive measures rather than treatment. Speaking of this, it reminds me of a presentation slide which spoke about how it's easier to raise strong children rather than heal broken adults. Hence, integrating the two perspectives gives us both a preventive come cure mechanism. We cannot speak about psychology without speaking about mental health. It is in front of me that the importance of mental health has risen and made sense to people. The transition in development is visible from the change of the definition of WHO, which initially stated mental well-being as an absence of disease, which has now transitioned to a complete physical, emotional and a psychological well-being. From the panel discussions, I gathered that the key to a balanced mental health is self-control, self-discipline and consistency. I would like to mention a few personal learnings now. I am someone who's found 
to take the maximum rounds of the restroom during the exam season. Till yesterday, I was laughing out loud on that. But yesterday, I also got to know about the connection of the gut and the mind. And also the impact of the tremendous stress I put on myself and my body. Acknowledgement of this problem will further enable me Thank you. <laughs> will enable, enable me to eradicate it by taking altering measures in the future. Another biased understanding that I kept to myself was that yoga is limited as a preventive measure and can't cure or provide relief to individuals who are suffering. But then yesterday, when Ms. Sharmila spoke about the case study she has been involved in and the res results she is and the results she revealed have changed my opinion and perception forever and for the good. Lastly, believe it or not, I have always believed in metaphors and that the world is my stage. I would borrow just one more minute. I'm ending my thing. I have always believed. And when Mr. Anand spoke about the world as a metaphor, there was nothing more I could agree with. Being a person with raw creative instincts, I have always believed in the power of art. With the coming of art-based therapy, I can already smell the success it is bringing with itself. When Mr. When Mr. Anand shared the story of Madhu, a schizophrenic patient with a low IQ contributing beautiful insights and overcoming her hallucinations through art-based therapy, my belief that art has no boundaries and that it treats everyone equally, liberates anyone who engages with it, engages with it, got strengthened. Wrapping up, all I want to say that with this conference, I'm not just signing off as a more educated student but as a much more enriched human too. And because I'm such a self-proclaimed connoisseur of art, please have a look at my perception of mental health through my expression of art, that is movies, outside on the mental health chart. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sakshi. And uh, here we come at the end of the working sessions uh, of this conference. Um, I don't. I don't think we need uh, um, any any more words to say that this has been a beautiful conference. Um, just the feeling of um, ease and relaxation that the audience has been demonstrating, and uh, of course the competence of the speakers. Um, and we hope that we are going to have uh, more future such conferences. I was looking at you, uh, Dr. Nivedita, and, and uh, the loving eyes uh, at, uh, with which you were looking at each one of these uh, students was, uh, I don't know, I don't know what to say, a proof of what, or you are a wonderful person, that's all. And so thank you again to everybody. I don't have much more to say. Um, I just thought when I when the, some of the kids, uh, some of the college students, were uh, referring to East and West. I was just reminding. Um, uh, recently, I was at the Jaipur uh, Literature Festival, and um, we we tend to think that the West is only the modern West. But we should also remember that the, the West is also contemporary of the Buddhist, uh, the Buddha's times. In fact, uh, in that festival, someone had, had sort of exhumed, I would say, a poem of uh, a Latin poet of the 4th century BC, which is titled De Rerum Nature. I mean, I'm, I'm Italian, so Latin I have, uh, I'm familiar with, which means about the nature of things, and which does not only look at the nature of external phenomena, but also of perception. So whether the Greeks got it from India or vice versa, it is also a subject of some level of scholarship. Um, India, of course, likes to think that it is <laughs> older, but I don't know about that. Um, I consider myself an Indian of Italian origin, so technically speaking, I'm an OCI older, so I'm sort of a, a dual personality. What, what am I going to do about this, Dr. Nived? 
I'll come for the session. Okay, thank you so much everybody again. I know that there are things to come, so let's close it here. And to the audience, thank you for being there. Uh, thank you to all the student panelists uh, for their for sharing their learning experiences. And uh, now I would like to request Miss Joya Roy, freelance uh, editor and former filmmaker, to kindly felicitate the chairperson and student panelists with souvenirs and katas. Uh, first, we have uh, the chairperson, Ms. Antonila Matu. <laughs> uh, we have Sohini Chakraborty, Department of Psychology. Uh, Varunika Gupta. Tejaswani Tenzin Putti Pemba Sri Pemba Sri Yasha Malhotra Sakshi Shivasta and Kelson Tashi I'm going to take advantage of this organizing a, a few seconds to say that if you don't have this book, you are missing something. This is an unbelievable um, book. This is um, awesome and it is going to change uh, and uh, improve your view of reality if you manage to read it. Slowly, slowly things can happen. And the one more thing I just wanted to say is that what about joining the Nalanda Diploma course if you don't know what to do in life? <laughs> yeah? And not promotion, it's just from my heart. Up next. Up next, we have valedictory sessions, so I request everyone to be seated. We will start in a, in a while. We have come to the conclusion of two-day national conference on understanding psychology and its practice, Eastern and Western perspectives, jointly organized by Tibet House uh, Culture Center of His Holiness the Dalai Lama Delhi and Earth Counseling and Art Based Foundation, Mumbai. For this session, I would like to welcome on the stage Keshe Dojo Damdil, Director of Tibet House, Dr. Nivedita Chalilji, Founder, Earth Counseling Based Therapy, Mumbai, and Mr. Ajay Vidya, Vidya Ji, former Jointly Secretary, Ministry of Information and Technology, Government of India, to take their respected seats. Please come.
Now may I request Geshe-la to kindly proceed with the session. Okay, so this is a very moment, momentous the two days um, with all the experts and the students taking part in this program and the way uh, Dr. the uh, Ms. Antonoji that the students taking part in this is so important and the whole purpose for Tibet House to organize most of the programs we make it a point that the students for example recently we had a, a program on quantum physics and the the brain and Buddhist philosophy in South India Bangalore so they also we made it a point that the students they're given the pre the, the presidents so that's very important to encourage the students and okay in this uh, the connection the I'd like to share some of my points later on for the time being the let's say we have Dr. Nividriji here and who has been who worked so hard to make sure that in the first place um, what I do is that the Tibet House from our side we always encourage people who are say the um, working so hard for the humanity for the community and so kind and uh, more on the academic academic and then uh, then the translating into the, the experience or the uh, the application <clears throat> so it has been like few years that I met Dr. Nivedirji and I found her as one of them and of course she's been inspired by two incredibly great uh, teachers Asha Ji and Zubin Ji, incredible teachers. So they formed the, um, so this, then I created this platform that Dr. Nivedidiji, why don't you, you know, collaborate with us, Tibet House, and then we can have this conference and eventually to reach out to the, the younger student, younger generation more. Okay, so we have Dr. Nivedidiji here uh, to shed some light or to what you, Think about this conference and how to take it forward. Thank you, Geshila. Um, so, needless to say, it's been a very exciting three days uh, from the pre conference workshop still today. Um, while, of course, we've learned so much, we've heard from different practitioners from different schools of thought. Um, and I think not just the views, but also applications in practice. And I think just now this panel hearing students, um, it's been immensely heartening because I feel uh, to hear what they have, what is their takeaway uh, is really key. And frankly, if anything that we want is for this next generation to feel inspired to carry work forward. Um, but in addition to all of the content and delivery that happened in the past three days, there's also something else which is really special which has happened, which I feel is really monumental. If you could just take a moment to look at the people on your right, left, front and back. Many of you are strangers, you're here for the first time. You come from different schools of thought, you come from different values, different practices, different religions, different, all kinds of differences. But in these few days, you have stayed, you have listened, you have held a space for each other, you have held a space for sharing. You have not only allowed for others to grow, but you've also experienced personal and professional growth um, at a time of really unrest on several fronts, whether it's political scenarios, whether it's environment, whether it's where the world is moving, whether it's trends, whether it's all of this. I think that we've got this one fantastic quality, which you've all exhibited in these past few days, which I really don't want to lose sight of. And I think if anything, we all um, should take that back because it means we have this capacity to hold space in larger different kinds of environments and um, situations and places. 
um, of course, that's the main takeaway for me as well for right now. Uh, the other part of it is being in terms of future and our work ahead. Um, there has definitely been a lot of conversation and discussion, but I recognize a need for deepening this dialogue. And that is something that we are going to think about. And we definitely hope you all will join us in that journey uh, to look um, in terms of also areas of work. I feel there have been four uh, specific areas which have emerged and as mental health uh, practitioners, we need to not only think of the practitioner and their practice, but also think of the individual and their context. And between these four, we need to kind of delve more into how these are interconnected and how they link with each other so that we can continue asking necessary questions so that we take necessary actions. And I hope this is only the beginning. And the other thing that I would like to end with is if there's been any merit which has been generated through this conference, we would really like to be, this benefit to be passed on to all sentient beings who are in need for this merit. So thank you very much. Immensely grateful to Geshela for his teaching and guidance all through these years. And of course to Team Tibet House, Tenzin Domala and everybody because they have been spectacular. So I would really like a round of applause for that extremely special team. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nvidriji. Uh, next we have here, most of you must have already seen uh, Mr. The Ajirji, and um, who was a great inspiration for me for the last many years, for many reasons. One, incredibly great kindness, incredibly great, really kind, compassionate. And then whatever problems do you have, he'll be always there to listen to you. He'll not talk to you. He'll just listen to you and look at your eyes with so much love and affection. It's so beautiful. This is who he, he is. And then love for knowledge with so much of heart and there's a tremendous love for knowledge. So this is what I see as the ideal person with displaying the heart somebody mentioned about connecting the, the head, the heart, and the hands. So that is exactly what we can see embodied in this great person, um, Mr. The Ajirji. So the, I requested him, uh, this, why not? The, deep inside me, I was telling him that why not you share your incredibly beautiful experience of your journey, your compassion, your quest for knowledge, and all this to these youngsters. But if I say this, he will say that I don't have anything. I'm not the, the fit person. So I didn't say anything. Just come and talk. Okay, so here we have um, Mr. Jirji. Please welcome him. Thank you, Geshela. I think uh, 10 minutes back, Tenzing Dorma came and he said, Geshela wants that you should speak. I was really wondering because I'm not a speaker, I'm not a student, but since he is my teacher, I thought that whatever I felt, I could really share that. Otherwise, I think it'd be disrespect to my teacher who has been teaching me, I don't know how many years now. Well, I think, uh, thank you, Geshela, for this opportunity. I really would like to say that uh, the topic which has been discussed here is one of the most important subject. Not that I'm saying it. I think this was almost about uh, maybe eight or nine years back. All the Nobel laureates who were living that time, they met in Sweden. And then they discuss what could be the frontier knowledge on which the world is going to focus. And everyone agreed it would be neuroscience. So I think all the people who are in this field, particularly the speakers and the students who have really presented such a wonderful uh, ideas, they are all touching the frontier subjects. I really would like to congratulate 
to every one of them. Now, as the student said, some of the audience member also shared, the subject which is discussed, I think there has been so wide, so uh, different in terms of the theoretical frame, in terms of practice, how does one really harmonize that? I think that was was stated by Dr. Nivedita Ji in the beginning also. I think it's uh, very challenging. In the one hand, the professionalism is growing. On the other hand, the contact point is not really reaching. I'm reminded of a story. There was a person who was suffering from an eye problem. He went to the doctor, the ophthalmologist. He tested and he said that your eyes are not good, so you need operation. And the doctor said that your left eye is not okay. And the doctor and the patient said that, okay, then you can do the operation. And the doctor said, I'm sorry, I can't really do because I'm the specialist of not the left eye, but of the right eye. Well, I think this is the kind of situation we are in. Hopefully, whatever the different aspects have been discussed, I fully agree with Nivedita Ji. Can there be some kind of enriched platform which can be, if not totally acceptable, but somewhat acceptable to everyone and to move from there? Well, I think uh, a lot of discussion has taken place in the mindfulness. As a student of uh, Buddhist psychology, in Timur House, I really would like to say that when we're really talking the mindfulness, particularly in the therapy aspect, we are really touching only the surface. If you really see the Buddha's teaching of the mindfulness, which he has given to the monks, the arhats in Shravasti, what is called the Anapanasati, there are 16 types of breathing which not necessarily just to stabilize the mind, but to come out of the samsara. So that's the kind of the suffering that he's really talking about. So similarly, he talked about the whole mindfulness, which he gave incidentally near Kuru Kshetra. That's why in the Sutra itself, it is written the land of the Kurus, because that time it is believed that the ethical standard of the people in this region was very high. So there he talked about the mindfulness of the body, where he has put almost about seven to eight types of breathing, the mindfulness of uh, feeling, mindfulness of mind, and mindfulness of the objects of the mind. So it's a really very wide spectrum. So to begin with, I would say that yes, I think mindfulness is good to calm down, stabilize but i think the long-term perspective if we are really seeing from buddha's point of view we need to really see from that framework my friend uh, shantam and myself we have been doing a lot of mindfulness workshops with the crpf because they have requested us because they have been working in the naxal area which is very very difficult area i think we have done three the whole idea was, can there be calm? The feedback which has come is that the Javans, the officers who were earlier not even joyful with each other, they were not really talking. Now they play jobs, they become at ease. So to that extent, yes, I think the mindfulness as it is understood today is really useful, but we need to understand from the long-term perspective. Now, giving a kind of story to see the different dimensions, uh, there, was a, there was a student who went to the teacher and he said that he wants to learn mindfulness. He said that, okay. So he gave a glass full of water and he said that kindly go around this monastery and ensure that you don't spill at all. 
So he went round. He didn't spill at all because his focus was so strong. And next day he said, okay, now what you do is that you move with this glass full of water and be aware of the surroundings also. What is there in front? Okay, what happened? He spilled some water because the mindfulness was very limited in the case of the first one. And after some training, he said that, okay, now you carry this, be aware of the environment, but at the same time, be mindful of what is really happening inside your mind also, which all of us will agree is very difficult. But that's a kindfulness. There's a kind of mindfulness that we are really aiming at or looking for. Well, I think uh, I really don't like to take more time, but I would say that uh, from the Buddhist perspective, unless or until we become Buddha, we are all insane. It may be very shocking statement, but this is made by one of the great authors called the Alan Wallace in his book, and which I think is very correct. And fortunately, the Buddha has told every living being has Buddha nature, which I think is a great blessing and great asset to us. We have to only work out. And as Geshe mentioned in one of the interventions, we all have free will. So can we use our free will so that this potential of Buddha nature, which Buddha himself has prophesied in every living being or every one of us, we can realize that. And then we would be free of all the mental ills and totally into, in the mental health state. Thank you very much, Geshe for giving this. Thank you, Ajirji, thank you so much. As some of you may even feel when he talks, there's warmth there. Okay, um, so let me begin, although I'm not going to speak for too long, let me begin with, let's say, the, the, in the form of the summary of the two-day uh, two program, uh, which I felt is that it's a very rich, say the interaction sharing and then we all the, learn from all these experts and some of them there's a tremendous richness to the material some of them the tremendous richness to the experience and then some of them the application that's really very encouraging from there uh, one thing that they what a sense is that everybody is trying to think of course the whole topic is the well-being uh, everybody is trying to talk about how to create this well-being. For whom? For us. So, one thing that we, uh, the from this talk, what I sense is that uh, the takeaway is that okay, I should keep myself well, physically, mentally, and emotionally. This is the takeaway. I should keep myself well. Number one. This I think would be if you if you forget this terminology, I should take care of my well-being. Then just say, be kind to myself. Be kind to myself. Number one. Then the thing is, all these the experts, uh, they and the practitioners, they give the shared the views, theories, the practice, experiences, and so forth. And so these are the means to get well to means the means to create the well-being so this means um, approach the I should be kind to myself but approach follow the right approach not the wrong approach after 10 years okay 2030 I remember Tibet has conducted a program in so they they talked about the well-being I should be kind to myself I'm now this little stress so I should go to pubs I should go to Pubs, pubs meaning alcohol to distress myself. So this is not wise. You're trying to be kind to yourself. You're not trying to be 
wisely kind to yourself. So the, all the means presented here for the today is a means to be wisely kind to yourself. So these two things, and um, then from this, the in fact, this question this girl came up with about I don't know what I'm really the what I'm looking for the kind of the spirituality or the, the happiness or the passion that I have I don't I cannot really locate that so that is a very serious question extremely serious question and that the um, so for that matter many people give many suggestions um, one thing is that we may not be in a position to see your own strength but the point is that there are so many good people around. Don't isolate yourself. Try to reach out to the good people. And sometimes good people meaning somebody who's learned, experienced, and very kind. Learn it, extremely learned, widely read, experienced, and very kind. Try to approach somebody like that. Not just somebody who's kind. Kind may not, not learn it, will not be able to give you directions, will not be able to see your strength. Somebody who's so learned but not kind may not be ready to give you any direction. We will say, okay, just you'll find it. So, therefore, learn it. Experience. Experience, not just learn it. Experientially, the person can see that way, what is your strength? And from there, the person can give you directions. So, learn it experience and the kindness so these three must be there so for that matter don't isolate yourself and the say the you may think that okay how can i really get i get to his holiness the dalai lama he's the one who's very learned experienced and kind right so don't expect to be, be, say somebody like very very big shots extremely greatly great example of the love knowledge and so forth the point is that around you in a college, for example, in a college, there could be you know, somebody who is more say, outgoing, outgoing not into the pubs, outgoing into the conferences and so forth. And then, okay, I'm, I'm interested to know what am I looking, really looking for. So then, through that person, you may need the person, you may need uh, meet person B. Through person B, you may need meet person A. So then, eventually, you'll come to get the right person. So this is how we should be a little open. There's, there must be open, openness or the open-mindedness. That's so important on our part. And then meanwhile, uh, say the uh, these conferences, by no means. His, so one th thing that I'd like to share with you is that His Holiness the Dalai Lama, his advice to us is that by no means these Buddhist centers. And Tibet House is not a Buddhist center in the first place. This is a very secular center. So by no means this should be the center for conversion. That is a very strong advice coming from His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So therefore, in all my efforts in the capacity as the director of Tibet House, all these conferences, I try to keep it as academic as possible, keeping away what we call a spirituality religiosity keeping away with this and then the some some of the people who are more spiritual or religious they may not be too happy with me so i can't do anything to uh, with that but this is the the reality so we have to maintain that the this should be a platform for everybody not only to you know some people only to some selected people should be to everybody so therefore uh, from this the questions coming from the the questions and the dilemmas coming from the students the students panel discussion uh, one said that uh, the spiritual is very abstract i fully agree with that and one said that i'm not too confident with the i'm not too happy with the what is that cpt whatever uh, the in terms of the practice i'm not really convinced these are all extremely important question points that must be brought up. That must be brought up. It's so good that these students they come up with these uh, the, the questions questions and the challenge. This is so important. Finally, the point is that I remember uh, we had the who was that? Okay, at uh, the teaching organized by Dr. Nivedi in Mumbai just recently. So then I said that 
Okay, say the how to deal with the depression patients, anxiety patients. Two, one is if the situation is very severe, where the person almost goes like very, very psychotic and lost their sanity altogether, no point of counseling, give them medication, antidepressants. But at the at them, these the, the adequate, proper and dosage. And then the where the sanity comes because of the medication, then a counseling must be done. Counseling must be done by a good counselor. Right? Counselor, oh we have a counselor there. No, by a good counselor. If there's a very good counselor who can like 80% and the efficiency is there, or 90% efficiency is there, then the dependence of medicine is going to be much less. But the counselor is fully on the money. Okay, your time up now. Okay, my next client. If this is the counselor, the benefit is going to be, benefit is going to be much less. So there, the counselor, quality of counselor is just like 20-30%. With this, the dependence of medicine should be like 70%. So the point is that the counselor is there. Also, to what extent the somebody can really convince me of the CPD or whatever the practice, it entirely depends. One, you as the individual. Then number two, the counselor, the quality of the counselor, the skills, compassion. And not only compassion, the skills. It depends on many factors. So so therefore I always in all my talks, when I give you know the public addresses, I make it a point that just come up with any questions that you have. It doesn't mean that I have all the answers. These questions are precious. So we'll take away, take these questions away. And this is a gift for me and gift for all of us. So these questions, these challenges must be um, openly discussed. And then the other one, uh, very beautiful is that, that above all, I'm a person. I'm a human being. This is so precious. So whatever religiosity that you're practicing, be it Jainism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Christian, Christianity, uh, Judaism, Baha'i, Sikhism, or Zoroastrianism, whatever you're following, is so precious. Keep it with you. That is your personal gift. Meanwhile, let us not forget that there are so many things that we share. There are so many things that we share. One is that we, when we feel sad, we all cry. Everybody cries. Not that the Indians cry and non-Indians, they don't cry. And then when you are sad, somebody comes not knowing who you are with the, the bread, with the, to counsel you or to just to, shape, to listen to you. You feel touched and everybody feels touched. This is not Buddhist touch. This is not Buddhist touch. This is not Hindu touch. This is not Indian touch. This is human touch. Everybody feels touched. We have so many beautiful things which are in common. Why don't we look at this common thing? So this girl, the, the student, who said that while I'm this, 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 and so forth, above all, I'm a human being. I'm a person. That is so precious message. So which is, with this in mind, um, the what I'd like to share with you, uh, the finally concluding uh, point, is that so this, uh, the humanity, the common, the humanity so how how to deal with this and the say things are there which is unique to me unique to you these if you emphasize them on the, the top as a priority they will simply divide us and the best way by which to you know to rule somebody is divide and rule so therefore your unity dissolves your unity crumbles so therefore the point is that we have to see how to how to really uh, the world is nowadays is breaking about. Look at all this politically, socially, and now the uh, the coronavirus and all this. There are so many things there. We don't really have to divide any further. There are already so many factors which would be more than enough for to divide the world. Now we need factors to unite the world. That is the common humanity common humanity, which embraces the, the environment as well. So this is so important. For that matter, we need two things. One is the practicality, the practicality for us to go ahead. And then the rich, the coating, 
behind this practicality. For the coding, we really need the rich knowledge. Uh, so on top of the, the practical application and experience and so forth, the rich knowledge is so important. And then say in this platform uh, for the two-day program, we have people who presented rich theoretical uh, the presentations. They are so precious, so precious. And we may not, some of may, may not be too uh, say attracted by them, more the practical size. Practical size is also very important. We need both. So therefore, the rich academic discussion is so important, number one. And um, this one, then the number two is for the humanity, how to make it really go out that everybody sues each other. And then you see that, okay, you are, you are my brother. You are my sister rather than, okay, only if you are a Hindu, you are my brother. Only if you are a Muslim, you are my brother or sister. This way we are going wrong. Only if you are from this caste, that caste, so this will be wrong. Only if you are from Gargi, uh, I love you. If you are not from non-Gargi, if you are from uh, non-Gargi, uh, they, then, okay, why are you here? You are not from the Dr. Sabine's student, right? So this kind of attitude, how to dissolve that? So, as I said earlier, you have your own the personal identities. Meanwhile, we have the common identity. The common identity, on the, if, we, if we give preference to the common identity, I'm a human being. We are sharing the same globe. We are finally, finally, what counts is that when I'm sad, somebody comes, whether my mother or unknown person, doesn't matter. Somebody comes and just gives me a hug and listens to me. That is what touches us. So that is a common humanity. So uh, this for this, we have today on this earth, we have His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the real embodiment of the humanity, the real embodiment of somebody working for the world at large, not just Tibet, not just Buddhism, Last, so wherever he travels, he talks about the the universal ethics, a system which is to be introduced in the modern education, where say anybody, whether you're believer or non-believer, whether you are Tibetan, non-Tibetan, everybody can embrace this. I know. Thank you. <laughs> and there's one student, the boy, who so courteously accepted. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so basically this is so important for all of us, for all of us, uh, the finally to see what's the common thing, common ground that we can work um, on for. So in this world, if you look at who is doing that, we see that uh, there could be many, there are many, but on a large scale, on the international level, it is His Holiness the Dalai Lama who the who talks about what is known as universal ethics and now percolated in a form of what is known as C learning, S E E learning, social, emotional, ethical learning to be implemented in the education program. So therefore, just see how much we all can take part in this program more. In other words, just to see how to enrich your compassion, love and compassion towards yourself and towards others by enriching your wisdom. So uh, the, we are inspired to see that there are so many answers here. And also Sabinji, thank you so much uh, to, because finally the students should be connected. And it is only the, the those like the daughter Sabinji uh, that you know who have the students. So they can bring. So you have taken a great um, so finally the students should be benefited. And the world, the future world, the the people should take uh, the carry forth this vision of the humanity and these are the youngsters and the message to be carried is the universal ethics okay thank you asian everyone thank you so much thank you <clears throat> thank you yeshila thank you mr ajirji thank you dr nivedita ji I hope you all have gathered tremendous aspects of uh, knowledge <clears throat> shared by the speakers from the dis different perspectives, which are extremely rewarding. And we wish you all that the valuable learning from this forum will continue to touch each of our lives and on our, on our way forward. And thank you to the speakers. Thank you very much. 
and yeah and i also would like to thank geshela for always guiding us in every now and then and dr nivedita the cornerstone of this conference and always helping and guiding us in every every feels for organizing this conference and i also like to thank my colleague for their cooperation last but not the least to all the audience for participating this conference and we hope to see you soon again as we are organizing a 30th padmavani lecture by tibet house on march 7 so we hope to see you soon there until then good afternoon and see you soon and lunch will be served at the same spot that that we last yesterday we had thank you bye bye